All right, welcome. Can everybody hear me? Um, I'm Eric Kuttner with the Emergency Response Design Group, and I wanted to thank uh, Rich for the intro, as well as I really wanted to thank Rich and his staff for uh, being willing to put this, uh, this forum on emergency preparedness together. Uh, as the governor said uh, in his remarks, this is uh, actually, he said, the most important issue out there. And I'd say everybody in this room could certainly agree it's the most important or one of the absolute most important that government or anyone else could be dealing with. And um, Certainly, I'm very glad that it's being addressed here at this level at Princeton University. Um, I'm actually a graduate of, of uh, the physics department here, a little different than the Woodrow Wilson School, but I'm always glad when, uh, when my alma mater does something that I think is this special. So I want to thank Rich very much and his staff. So. Um. So we'll start without further ado. Uh, the way we're basically going to do this is I'll do some quick introductions of the speakers. As Rich said, uh, their full bios are in the paperwork you all have. Um, and then I'm going to let each of them speak for a little while, provide some initial intro and remarks, and then I'll have a few questions for them, and then we'll go right to audience questions and hopefully get a lot of good dialogue going. So um, first off is uh, Dick Kanyas, who is the uh, director of New Jersey's Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness. Um, I'd like to note, actually, I'm a, a big fan of the fact that preparedness is put in the title of that, uh, of that department of that agency. Um, it's one of the things I wish the Department of Homeland Security was actually security and preparedness as well. I think that's a very important term. Um, and so uh, I'll just say uh, it's a cabinet level, uh, it's a cabinet level position. Uh, he came to the position uh, with a diverse national security background. He had served as the director of uh, the National Drug Intelligence Center, special agent in charge of the uh, Phoenix DEA office. Uh, special assistant to the CIA, um, and uh, he worked uh, under Presidents George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton, uh, serving as director of the White House's National Security Council, heading the Directorate for Counterterrorism and Counter Narcotics. So, uh, wonderful person for us to have here, and I'll let Dick go ahead with his remarks. Thank you, Eric. Um, first, a uh, no, I'd rather not. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. I mean. Um, uh, first, a small commercial about uh, our Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, if I could take 30 seconds to do that. Uh, our, it's a very diverse portfolio that, that we have. It starts with uh, coordinating counterterrorism for the state. Uh, it has um, the uh, state's administrative agent, which handles all the grants, federal and state, that come through the state. Uh, we do training, counterterrorism training. We do uh, uh, critical infrastructure uh, protection. Uh, with vulnerability studies, we do uh, uh, planning and preparedness for disasters. Uh, so as you can see, we also do school security as of last year, campus and school security. So we have a very diverse uh, uh, functions, group of functions that we, we perform. It's in this, the latter one, in the planning and preparedness in that capacity that I'm speaking uh, to you today. Uh, in that regard, uh, I, I should mention that, uh, as we've heard, you know, are we safe, are we safer, uh, that argument we, which we get all the time. I just have to say that uh, the way we view it, it's really more of a journey than a destination. Uh, the priorities change uh, every year, almost month by month sometimes. Uh, I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, you're all interested, and I agree with Eric's comments that this is probably uh, the most important uh, issue that we have on the table, but you wouldn't know it by the news uh, and the state of the economy which uh, dominates uh, our attention today. So we view it through that prism as well. But from 9-11, seven years ago, um, uh, and plus, uh, where the focus was on prevention uh, and to keep an event like this from occurring again, the event like this happened to be a terrorist event. And a lot of our attention, uh, most of it, went into counterterrorism efforts. As the governor mentioned, information sharing, critical. Connectivity between emergency responders, critical. Uh, a variety of priorities that were put on the table. And indeed, uh, the Office of uh, Homeland Security at the federal level was created because of that terrorism event. It, di it didn't last but a few years before we were hit by Katrina, and we realized that we were not prepared for major disasters, and another thing was added to uh, the Homeland Security uh, event. Uh, shortly after that, we had the Minneapolis Bridge collapse, and you'll hear from uh, Steve Flynn this afternoon, and another item was added to our lexicon, resiliency in our critical infrastructure. 
Now we have cybersecurity, which is in the hands primarily, the, the emergencies uh, will be in the hands of the private sector on any type of cyber terrorism. Those, those are the life-sustaining uh, uh, critical uh, infrastructure within the state, not so much the Garden State Network. If my BlackBerry goes out, I'm really thrilled because it, it buzzes every five minutes uh, with almost every little announcement. But if that were to fail, I, don't, I think we're still in good shape. But if the hospital uh, 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 networks and the energy and grid networks and some of these life-sustaining functions were to fail because of a terrorist attack, you know, that, that is, is obviously more, more critical. Um, so, and, and uh, today we have the economy. We just finished, uh, I just finished reading a paper by ASIS about the effects of the economy on our security and, and the insider threat. And so we're, what I'm saying is it keeps morphing. And oh, by the way, Al Qaeda is still out there and is still trying to kill us. So nothing, we really added things to, uh, to the, uh, uh, the challenges that, that we face. So it's a continuing uh, effort. Uh, last year, the governor added uh, school and campus security to the portfolio of New Jersey's Office of Homeland Security. And while I, I see a lot of familiar faces, and I, I know you all understand this, but there may be a few out there that do not. We, uh, the Office of Homeland Security Preparedness, is not part of the federal Department of Homeland Security. This is New Jersey's Office of Homeland Security. My boss is the governor, um, not Janet Napolitano. But, and, I, and I say that because I, we get asked this uh, a lot. Uh, we must get five, six uh, queries about immigration in our office every day, and we refer them to the federal uh, Department of Homeland Security. So but we still have a lot more work to do, even in New Jersey, to recognize what our functions are which brings us to uh, public awareness and, and such. But the, the question today uh, has to do more with critical infrastructure and what we have done in the last seven years to protect our critical infrastructure. And indeed, we've done a lot. As the governor points out, uh, you know, we've, there's been no want of, of effort, uh, especially within New Jersey. Uh, the, the governor uh, has laid on us three basic principles to, uh, to work from, and we've applied these very strictly. Uh, one is the principle of inclusiveness. You cannot work homeland security at the, at, the, at the local or at the federal level without including all of the partners, and that includes public and private. So inclusiveness is key. The other key that this, will, uh, that this effort will not work uh, without is regionalization. And while this is difficult in a home rule state, it needs to be done. Our partners in this are New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and they have to be included in any type of investment justification and any type of strategy for planning. So regionalization is key to any effort that we, we promote. And the, the third is transparency, and that mainly applies, uh, it's more critical when you talk about uh, managing the federal dollars. At any given time, our office manages over $350 million worth of grants that have spanned since 2003. And uh, that, it's critical that there be trust in, in, in doing that. We manage critical uh, infrastructure protection in the same way as we manage our grant dollars, and that is from the ground up. We include all of the municipal and counties in county working groups. They're the ones who uh, write the investments, submit them to us. We apply the principles, whether they're from the uh, uh, federal guidelines or the eight areas of, uh, of interest that the uh, federal government uh, uh, applies to these grants. And we ensure that they, comp uh, in compliance with these, are realistic submit them to the federal government, and then as they come back down, we distribute them. We have 45 days to distribute or obligate uh, these dollars. Uh, we have uh, operated uh, this, again, under these three principles, uh, operated the, the, the management of this, and, and this is the key, and this is the segue into the discussion this morning. It has to be risk-based. You know, that is the difference today than perhaps for maybe five years ago. The distribution of funds and the distribution of priorities for Homeland Security in this state is all risk-based. And what is risk? It's vulnerabilities, consequences, and threats. 
We apply a formula to those, and that determines risk within our critical infrastructure. So in that regard, when you apply that formula, based on specific threats, out, luckily, uh, outside of uh, the continental United States, the number one threat, of, uh, or number one sector under risk in the state is our mass transit. And the reason for that is that it is an open environment, extremely difficult to police. You can't search every car that goes through the Holland Tunnel. As an open environment, we have to uh, effect deterrence as one of our key strategies to this. There will be very little forewarning, but we do know that the weapon of choice globally, by corporate al-Qaeda at least, has been attacking rail systems, whether it's Mumbai or Spain or London. So we know that they, 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 they do uh, adhere to that. So we watch that sector and we work with our, again, regionally with our partners to protect that sector, uh, probably number one uh, in this particular state. And I should point out one other thing. The northern part of New Jersey mirrors New York City, not only in population and critical infrastructure, and the bridges and tunnels across the Hudson have two ends uh, to them, uh, something the federal government didn't know until a couple of years ago, uh, that uh, they were dispersing their dollars and any threat to the, uh, our tunnels were counted on the New York City side. Well, we fixed that, um, but they do recognize. But again, by working regionally, you avoid the argument and you maximize the attention on that particular sector. Obviously, we have 18 to 20 sectors, depending who counts, uh, that are uh, important. The governor has placed the educational sector higher than perhaps the federal government does, but that's in the state and we work within those nuances. But certainly our chemical industry and our communications industry and our health industries are as high. The way that priority is managed is from the ground up, the same way we manage our intelligence from the ground up. We think it's a mistake to sit there and wait for the federal government to tell us what the possible threats might be in Bayonne when we have experts in security in Bayonne that are not being voiced. And if there is any recommendation that we would make to the federal government, it would be that you have to deal with information sharing from the ground up. Internationally, that's a different matter. And national security information that the governor was referring to, correct, that has to be shared, that national security information that deals mainly with uh, the exterior uh, of, of this country. Interior, it's controlled by 150,000 uh, police departments. It can, it's controlled by sheriff's departments. It's controlled by emergency response community. They are the experts within that area of responsibility and the, the synthesis and centralization of that information to be mined is the challenge. Very, very difficult for a federal government to do that, if not impossible. But we can do it with state by state. There is no one-stop shopping for hometown information. It has to be centralized through record management systems, uh, uh, synthesis, and, uh, and the like. So it's, it's, a, it's a daunting challenge to get your arms around information that you can be predictive. But that is the challenge that we, we face here. Uh, we think we've, we've uh, made great strides in that regard. The private sector is injected into this formula through a variety of ways. Statutorily, there is the Domestic Security Preparedness Task Force, which by statute, uh, which I chair as well, is a cabinet level group that the private sector has three representatives on that board. That is the statutory board that writes policy for the state. Under that, there is the Infrastructure Advisory uh, Council, which is made up of these 18 private, sector, uh, 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 private sectors, and each have a chair. And we, in addition to that, the governor has a kitchen cabinet, which I chair, a private sector advisory group that just pings on policy matters as, as trends change. So just to, to, to summarize, uh, what we want to underline is that it is, you know, we, we work at this saying uh, as it morphs from month to month, priority to priority. 
very, very uh, uh, dynamic and impossible to manage without you, without the academia behind us. We have a preparedness college that we try to, uh, to, to, to ping occasionally to contribute to this because it is an all uh, sector, all people effort. Not only the public, but the, the, all of the sector chairs, CEOs, in this have to contribute to Homeland Security for it to work. And that's kind of the challenge. That's the progress that has been made in the last seven years, is organization, bringing organization to that process. It can be done. It's not science yet, but it still is an interagency process that can be managed. And, and that's how it's, at least that's how our office is doing it here in New Jersey. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, introduce John Pechkowski next. Um, John is the uh, Director of Emergency Management and Security for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, as well as a Naval Postgraduate School Distinguished Fellow at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, He's worked for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey since 1978, holding a variety of executive level positions in planning, policy, and operations. And in December of 01, he was appointed Director of Emergency Management and Security, where he's responsible for oversight of all critical infrastructure protection and emergency readiness programs. Uh, he's also a uh, retired colonel with 33 years of active and reserve service in the U.S. Marine Corps, it's both an infantry and combat engineer officer. He was the initiator for the Marine Corps Emergency Preparedness Liaison Officer Program part of a joint service effort to coordinate DOD support to civil authorities during times of national emergency. He's also the Executive Vice President of the Security Analysis and Risk Management Association. Uh, so John, I'll let you go ahead. Thank you, Eric. Um, you should all know that, that Eric asked me to try and make this as informal and interactive as possible, and so we decided that we would not use PowerPoint slides. For any of you who've ever seen my PowerPoint slides, you know that's a blessing. Um, and also, for those that, you ha that haven't seen my PowerPoint slides, uh, you should be eternally grateful to, to Eric uh, for saving you the pain. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the scope and scale of Port Authority operations. I'll give you some insight into our security programs since 9-11, and then talk a little bit about things I think we still need to do and describe some shifts in our focus in the area of security and preparedness. Uh, that, are, that are now coming about uh, seven or so years after that terrible day. Um, we live in a tremendously complex and interdependent region. Uh, when we do our planning, we look at a 23-county metro area centered on New York City, um, roughly 18.8 .8 million people, uh, gross uh, regional domestic product of about uh, $900 uh, billion. And of course, New York City is a global center for business and commerce. The Port Authority has always been a part of the fabric of that region, a very important part. And for those that, uh, of you that are not familiar with the Port Authority, we're much more than the port itself. A uh, bi-state agency formed in uh, 1921 with a transportation and economic development mission. Uh, our jurisdiction spans uh, 1,500 square miles, uh, roughly uh, uh, centered on the Statue of Liberty. Um, and uh, encompasses uh, a good bit of uh, northern metro New Jersey and all of the uh, boroughs of the city of New York. We're largely self-supporting from uh, business income, rents and user fees, annual budget about $6.7 billion, and uh, perhaps more significantly, a capital investment budget of uh, well over $3 billion. Um, we're smaller than we were historically because we're getting a little bit better and smarter about how we do business. Roughly 7,000 personnel, and uh, out of that, uh, not uh, um, uh, insignificant, is 1,600 police officers out of that total. Um, and that, that, of course, has grown since 9-11. Uh, we also uh, have uh, probably the largest contract security guard force in the region, so a substantial presence as a part of our corporate structure uh, devoted to security. We move a lot of people and stuff, uh, just some quick stats, uh, 254 million transit vehicle trips, uh, 72 million bus passengers. Uh, we're a big part of the uh, Trans-Hudson uh, Interstate Transportation Network, uh, moving uh, 72 million rail transit riders. And of course, um, a big part of our operation is the uh, regional airport network, which includes Kennedy, Newark, LaGuardia. Uh, we recently acquired Stewart Airport, about an hour north of the city and uh, the largest general aviation airport in the region, Teterboro Airport. Uh, so we've moved 110 million air passengers uh, each year, 
along with 3 million tons of air cargo. And of course, the port, the third largest port in the country, the largest on the East Coast, 5 million 20-foot uh, equivalent units or containers um, are moved for the port every year. And of course, we face some significant security challenges. Uh, we operate complex and critical facilities that are, of course, gateways to the nation, uh, the region, and the urban core. Um, and a lot of our facilities actually sit in bedroom communities within the region as well. So we operate in a very public and a varied environment. Um, and of course, if you know the history of the Port Authority, we've also been identified as high threat targets. Um, We've had the pleasure of two major attacks by international terrorists, both the same place at the World Trade Center in 1993 and 2001. I had the good pleasure of being in the building on both occasions. Um, and of course, the World Trade Center was our flagship facility, our corporate home. Uh, we lost many of our senior staff and a good number of my personal friends. So this whole issue of uh, homeland security and preparedness is something very uh, near and dear to the hearts of all Port Authority staff. And of course, we're still in the top tier on the national target list. Um, so we have this challenge of having to manage the delicate balance between uh, security and mobility. Uh, we see the Port Authority as being fundamental to the regional economy. Uh, transportation, of course, is the lifeblood of commerce. And in our view, commerce is the lifeblood of democracy. So we feel we have a very important uh, mission in Homeland Security, uh, not only in terms of the region, but nationally. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about the evolution of our infrastructure security programs. After the 1993 bombing, of course, the Port Authority launched a very intensive series of security audits at all of its facilities, essentially a traditional security audit, uh, subject matter experts telling us where to put offenses and closed circuit TVs. Of course, we were hit in a very untraditional way on 9-11, uh, but the Port Authority, uh, traditional to all bureaucracies, basically did the same thing it did in 1993 got the same consultants back, did the same kind of security audits, except in a more comprehensive and intensive way. Uh, when they were done, we had a stack of security studies two feet high, literally 23 different reports, 1,100 recommendations, and by staff's rough estimate, um, rec recommendations which would have involved capital expenditures well over $1 billion. We just lost the World Trade Center, downtown path tubes, interstate traffic was down, air traffic and port traffic was down. There's no way we could pay for that. Um, so at the time I was the assistant director of operations, my boss said, look, you know, you got this problem, figure it out, and oh, by the way, you have to brief the board uh, in a month on uh, these recommendations and also how we're going to pay for them. So I did that and asked the board essentially to write a blank check for $500 million with a promise that I would come back within a year with a risk-based five-year security capital improvement program, and, and we did that. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, we now operate uh, basically a rolling five-year security capital program. We do major risk assessment every two years, um, and we've incorporated security risk management as part of our overall business processes. Um, and that uh, reassessment of security risk is ongoing throughout the agency. It's in fact now driving what is probably going to be an enterprise-wide risk management program for the entire agency. A little window into some of our major security initiatives since 9-11. Of course, we expanded police operations and, uh, and, and brought in new capabilities and training for our officers uh, like everyone else has. Um, and we are tremendously integrated into the regional uh, intelligence network, uh, not to be redundant. We had, didn't build an internal intelligence capability, but made sure that we were not only linked in with the Joint Terrorism Task Forces, but we have a Port Authority police presence embedded within the uh, fusion centers in both states. Uh, working with uh, Dick's folks and uh, the New Jersey State Police, um, and uh, also uh, with the New York City Police Department, so that we stay plugged into the intelligence flow that comes through those various agencies. And of course, it's reciprocal, so whatever we know from our police agencies are immediately shared. And that's sort of our early warning uh, network, if you will. Uh, Focus on landside cargo security. We implemented random and continuous vehicle inspection campaigns uh, as needed. Uh, a lot of uh, additional equipment for our officers in terms of handheld WMD detection systems. Maritime cargo security, our focus has pretty much been on the supply chain, trying to keep a target or a, a weapon from getting to a target and using the uh, maritime logistics chain as the vector for the transmission of that weapon. 
Um, our Port Commerce security folks play a major role in the Area Maritime Security Committee. In fact, our uh, Port Commerce Security uh, Manager uh, sits as the chair of that committee uh, and working hand in hand with the Coast Guard and our private sector port partners. Uh, highway and transit security, a lot of the focus there is on infrastructure hardening and uh, physical security systems, intrusion detection systems, access control, CCTVs and the like. Um, and uh, we have done extensive uh, computer modeling and simulation of the physical attributes of our facilities, particularly in terms of uh, hardening uh, against improvised explosive devices. And a lot of the Port Authority's capital investment has gone into uh, the physical strengthening of those facilities, the uh, George Washington Bridge, Staten Island Bridges, and other facilities as well. Aviation security, in addition to working closely with the Department of Homeland Security on passenger and cargo screening, we have uh, tightened up security as well, and there the focus is on perimeter intrusion detection. Uh, for some time, and this is the same across the nation, a lot of emphasis was going into passenger screening, and then later on baggage screening. And that's, it's sort of like putting a deadbolt on your front door, while at the same time you have a screen door in your kitchen that's left wide open. And we have 40 miles of perimeter around our aviation facilities if we look at all of them together, and all we had was basic chain link fence and little CCTV overwatch. So we now have a $100 million security program to tighten up perimeter intrusion detection using uh, radar, closed circuit TV, enhanced uh, police patrols and the like, um, in, and that's the focus in aviation. And of course, the Aviation Department has also continued to be a leader in national aviation security issues. Commercial building facility, we did a strategic plan for the World Trade Center that is now guiding um, physical security improvements as that facility gets uh, redeveloped. And we've been a leader in WMD countermeasures test bedding of technologies uh, out of the Department of Homeland Security and the national labs. In fact, even before the uh, Office of Homeland Security is formed at the national level, we developed a partnership with the Department of Energy for a countermeasures test bed program and early testing of radiological uh, monitoring systems and interdiction protocols. At the corporate level, uh, we've established the corporate level security governance practices. We have a committee of the board that's assigned and then an operating committee of uh, career staff who help to uh, manage our security program, provide guidance to uh, the public safety department and uh, my office in particular. Uh, we continue to lead in various national level and regional homeland security forums because uh, it's not uh, our nature to sit back and just complain as policy gets developed. We feel that if you're not a part of the solution, or not a part of the, the solution, you're a part of the problem. And of course, we've made improvements in uh, both security and emergency response situation awareness, a new emergency operations center, and we're working hard to integrate our security systems at these facilities and tie them back centrally at a corporate level. I think the cornerstone of what we've done in security is we've, um, aside from the physical improvements, is we've imp implemented an enterprise-wide security risk management program. Um, of course, we were, we were whacked uh, on 9-11, to be perfectly honest with you, and uh, it really caused us to think differently uh, what happened between 1993 and 9-11 and how can we prevent this. And what we needed to do was to develop a risk management mindset, as Dick said, you don't have enough resources and people and time to address everything. So how do you parse those out and set priorities? And a lot of people uh, you know, think risk management all the time, but we had to take a very deliberate approach to it. We had a billion dollars worth of consultant recommendations that had to be vetted. We only had $500 million to spend. And how did we go through that process? So we worked, uh, we reached out to the Department of Justice, again, before the Department of Homeland Security was formed. We got some resources to develop what we think is a best practice model for critical infrastructure risk management. And we've implemented that, and we're now, now on a two-year cycle of comprehensive risk assessments and vulnerability surveys that then drive our rolling five-year security plan and decisions at the corporate level that drive operating and capital investments. And as I said before, that's now incorporated into the fabric of the way the Port Authority does business. Um, let's see. Uh, some thoughts on where I think we are and where we need to go, just to sort of sum up. Um, internally to the Port Authority, we've, we've bought a lot of stuff. We've put a lot of technology in place, um, and we need to focus on the integration of that technology and that 
it's not as easy as it might sound. We have a lot of legacy security systems and new, new security systems we've overlaid on top of that. Um, but beyond the technology, the biggest challenge really is more an institutional one and has more to do with people. And um, we're really beginning to focus on this as we think about corporate resilience is continuing to maintain a mindset of security and a mindset of preparedness in Port Authority staff. Now, you heard the word today, complacency. We can, even in Port Authority, which we consider to be the 9-11 agency and probably should, should be most aware of these kinds of things, we can sense a sort of complacency about where we are. And in fact, people are getting tired because a lot of effort has been put into this. And I know I, I run into this all the time when I work with our operating departments. They don't want to see me coming through the door because they know it means additional work. But we have to keep coming back at it. And so now we're really focusing on how we, we develop this sort of internal mindset about security, working it into our day-to-day -day businesses, building security into new capital expenditures. And a, a big emphasis now going forward is going to be working with our private sector partners who really are the guts of our operations at the port and, and aviation facilities in particular. Um, that is going to be a big focus of our effort going forward. Uh, we have spent a lot of time on internal business continuity and continuity of operations. So we feel confident we can get the Port Authority administrative structure back up and running. But I won't be able to get the ports back up and running or the airports unless those private sector operators, contractors, and service providers also have business continuity plans and are just as ready to come back to work as we are. And so that has to be a major focus. And uh, as we've gone through our risk assessment process now, we're maturing. Um, we have, uh, in the last uh, iteration of that risk assessment, built a cost-benefit model that allows us to look with more fidelity at individual capital investments and also see interdependencies between various uh, investments in our security. Um, but our, our focus had been almost myopically on terrorism and security investment. We, we were focusing less in our risk assessment program on all hazards, even though we've, we've beefed up our security and our emergency management and our preparedness program simultaneously. But I have to be more concerned and, in fact, deal with a probably a greater probability of being hit with a major um, natural hazard as well. Uh, class uh, Category 4 hurricane in New York area could be tremendously devastating. We would lose the interstate tunnels and bridges. Uh, Kennedy and LaGuardia airports would be underwater, and uh, the city would essentially be uh, inundated, uh, and a lot of our critical infrastructure taken out. So I have to prepare for that as well. So this year, in our next iteration of risk management, we're working with DHS to actually uh, mature our methodology to be an all-hazard risk assessment uh, program. And we think it's a, probably a good model for regional and state-level application as well. Um, beyond that, uh, during my fellowship at DHS, what I'm attempting to do is to work with the National Preparedness Directorate on addressing what has been referred to as the, the partnership between the federal government and state government in Homeland Security and Preparedness. All of our national level security documents really speak to the importance of this partnership and of course in, in our government we operate under the, 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 the rubric of federalism and uh, in the federal government doesn't tell a governor of a state what to do. Um, and because it's homeland security, it really is a, needs to be a coordinated and integrated effort between the federal government and state government. But there's been a lot of rhetoric along those lines, but when we actually look at grant programs and the bureaucratic requirements that we get from DHS, it becomes more parental in nature. And I think there's a realization at DHS now that that has to change, and I think uh, Secretary Napolitano is going to do a tremendous amount of good to help change that focus. I think a governor's perspective in dealing with these issues is absolutely key. So we're looking at changing the nature of that contract, reassessing it, and helping to provide some input to DHS going forward. So with that, uh, that's an overview of our operations, uh, what we've done since 9-11, and a little bit we're trying to do on a national level. Eric? Thanks, John. Um, and we'll certainly have a lot of questions related to all of that. Uh, next up, we have uh, Ben Cooper, uh, Commander Ben Cooper, actually, uh, who's the Chief of the Response Department for the U.S. Coast Guard Sector, Delaware Bay, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, so right across the border. Um, actually, I want to really thank him for uh, being a good sport and for rearranging his schedule last second. He was, uh, we had a, a change up in the speakers, and he's just perfect for this, but uh, he had to adjust his travels a bit for a day, so I want to really thank him for, for being here. Um, 
He, as, uh, as Chief of Response for Sector Delaware Bay, he oversees all traditional Coast Guard operational missions in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware tri-state region, including maritime law enforcement, search and rescue, homeland security, pollution response, and all hazards disaster response missions. <clears throat> he oversees a staff of approximately 450 active duty and reserve personnel and directs the performance of six small boat stations and five cutters in the region. So he's uh, a responder in, in all of these areas. He's uh, protecting critical infrastructure, from a, critical infrastructure from a response perspective every day. And thanks for being here. Thank you, Eric. Well, it's, uh, thank you for having me today. I find this interesting that we're talking about this, the state level and all the challenges you have with the critical infrastructure of many different uh, systems. I, I focus mostly on maritime security, but at the federal level with the three states and working with the local agencies in preparedness. Uh, with the Port Authority, you're talking, you know, an enormously important port focused on one area where you can control how you spend the money and how you can um, allocate your uh, resources to improve critical infrastructure. But the Coast Guard is in, a, is in a different position. We have three states that we work with. We, I represent the lower half of New Jersey, I guess, with the the uh, security in the Philadelphia region, Camden region, uh, out to Cape May, and um, talk a little bit about what we look at from a, a three-state level from maritime security. And uh, John talked a little bit about the Area Maritime Security Committee. Maybe explain how that works and, and why. I, th I think that's a very good model. We talk about sharing information, uh, working at the local level, getting the information from the local level up through the federal government to try and coordinate uh, critical infrastructure protection. Uh, I will give a little bit of plug here for the Coast Guard. Um, what's the Coast Guard doing in Princeton today? Well, we are a uh, small federal agency, one of the 22 agencies that became part of DHS back in 2003. Um, we may have quite a few of those 88 congressional committees that you talked about reporting to, Governor. Um, we have 13 statutory mission areas. Um, quite a few, you'd be kind of surprised about it, then you think, oh, I wonder who did that mission. You think, um, what about the, remember the Exxon Valdez? It's the 20 year anniversary for the Exxon Valdez. Well, guess what, that's, that's a Coast Guard mission. Quite a lot came out of something called the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. And uh, we spend a good deal of time in the Philadelphia region working with pollution issues, maritime pollution. Uh, we have six refineries there and uh, take about a, a, a million barrels of crude oil into the Delaware Bay every day. Um, we, we also have several other missions. Uh, you think of search and rescue. Uh, I hope a few of you have seen the movie The Guardian. If you haven't, you ought to go out and rent it. Kevin Costner does a great, great job in that movie. Uh, he is a rescue swimmer. And to demonstrate today, I, I brought a rescue swimmer with me today. Lee, would you stand up, please? Lee Gorley. Actually, it's not, not true. He was a rescue swimmer. <laughs> Lee was a, a true American hero. He used to jump out of perfectly good helicopters to save lives in peril at sea. And then we sent him off to OCS. He was going to fly helicopters, uh, helping also to save lives in peril at sea, and then he got too old. And uh, so now he ends up doing ports, waterways, and coastal security, and works for me, and I'm really happy to have him. He does a great job. So, true American hero, Lee. Thank you. Uh, so, watch The Guardian tonight. That's one of our missions as well, a traditional Coast Guard mission. Rent it, uh, or however you do it nowadays. You don't even have to go out and rent it. Some other missions might not think of. Uh, fisheries, law enforcement. You have some rich fishing grounds off the coast. Uh, if you've had scallops, or scallops, as they say up north, right? They're probably out of uh, what's called the Elephant Trunk Access Area, which comes off the coast of New Jersey and Delaware. And uh, it's open now, and they're fishing like crazy. Um, unfortunately, last week we lost six men on a fishing boat who were out there fishing in uh, uh, rough seas. Um, we don't know the cause of the incident, but six of seven men died out there. And uh, I had the unfortunate responsibility of briefing the families that our search was about to end. And uh, I'll tell you, that's a very difficult thing to do. So one of our statutory missions, is we pride ourselves on doing that well. Um, but uh, one of the things I'll tell you is that 
9-11, we spent less than 5% of our time thinking about homeland security. Today, I'd say I probably spend 50% of my time. But if you wonder why I'm not spending 98% of my time, it's because I have a few other things to work, about, work with, too. Uh, Coast Guard does uh, natural disaster response. You think about Hurricane Katrina, right? The rescue swimmers were down there saving lives in the city, in the city of New Orleans. And um, we did a lot of prepositioning prior to Hurricane Katrina, so we were on the scene at the time. But many other natural disasters happen that don't quite rise to the level of Katrina, obviously, um, but we're, we're very integrated with FEMA and uh, uh, local and state agencies uh, on the local level because we do that at sea. Um, we do national security operations. Uh, you may be unaware that the Coast Guard is in Iraq. We have cutters and personnel in Iraq. Um, you might wonder why. Why don't we just have the Navy do that? Well, you know, most of the world doesn't need a Navy, quite honestly. They're not going to go out in deep blue water and fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with the old Soviet Union, right? Um, they need a Coast Guard. They need to protect their coast. They need to uh, control their fisheries to ensure safe operations and protect their critical infrastructure. So uh, it wasn't that long ago we lost a Coast Guardsman who was helping to protect the uh, offshore oil platform off Iraq, uh, working alongside the Navy. And uh, something you may not be aware of. I don't coordinate that in Philadelphia, but I just sent a guy uh, out there to do that. And then finally, a major focus is Homeland Security. Like I said, probably 50% of my time, we look at how we can help protect critical infrastructure better, uh, ensure we know exactly what's out there, how can we buy down risk by using our assets throughout the three-state region to uh, reduce the threat? And uh, I'll talk a little bit about our, our risk analysis model that we use in the Coast Guard that uh, I think is a good model. I'll be interested to see your model, too, sir. But, uh, you're applying it. The same thing, right? Mast. The, well, you're overlaying a mast on top of it. That's the right. model. Right. And it's area maritime security. So we're looking at 365 ports nationwide, uh, 95,000 miles of coastline, pretty open coastline, to be honest with you. And um, we, are, we are doing our best to uh, defend the critical infrastructure within that. Um, Lee's job is he's the head of my ports, waterways, and coastal security branch. And what does that mean across the... 120 miles of the Delaware River and the coastlines in our area. Well, we look at the critical infrastructure out there, the nuclear power plants, the refineries, the bridges, the super tankers, the choke points. The, um, the Coast Guard looks at that and, and we try to patrol those areas. We will escort cruise ships, super tankers, uh, ferries to, like I said, kind of buy down the risk of those facilities. We have a vessel boarding and search team that applies a risk analysis model to look at ships coming in from overseas. Uh, during 9-11, we had some, at, at the time of 9-11, we had some pretty poor reporting systems. 24-hour notice was all we got. Well, they, they put in uh, requirements to have 96-hour notice. So in those 96 hours, we know where they're coming, where they're going, we know who's on board, we know the cargo, we know the ship's history gets vetted by our intel systems. And then based on a risk analysis model, we'll send the team offshore to verify the veracity of what they say they've done. We'll go out with radiation pagers and try to defend our country. Um, and, and then, like I said, we, we also do daily patrols throughout our region, so throughout the, throughout the area. To do all these missions, we work closely with our federal, state, local port partners, industry, um, we work closely with emergency preparedness personnel from the city and the states, uh, environmental protection groups. We, uh, we assume that most incidents, well, probably nearly all incidents, are going to involve a unified command structure. It's not just going to be the Coast Guard or the FBI in charge. It's going to be a, a group of agencies at the federal, state, local, and industry level. So we are very familiar with the uh, Incident Command System, ICS. In fact, we just finished up a training yesterday where we had uh, New Jersey State Police, Pima, Pennsylvania State Police, Philadelphia Police, Coast Guard Active Duty and Reserve, 
in a 300 level team training so that we're familiar with each other and we are, are ready to do a, to work as a unified command. Um, and that's an all, hazard, all hazards approach. We can't predict what exactly what will happen, but the response uh, protocols are the same, whether it's a forest fire, whether it's a major oil spill, whether it's a hurricane response, or a terrorist response, unfortunately. Um, protocols are similar, and we, we practice to work together. We're here today to talk a little bit about critical infrastructure protection, and um, I must say I claim no great knowledge of critical infrastructure uh, decision making on the grand national scale. I'm as frustrated as you are when I read the New York Times article about the petting zoo or the uh, Amish popcorn factory that was initially put on a critical infrastructure list because it met the, you know, it met the requirements of what critical infrastructure was when DHS reached out to the local levels. I'm frustrated by that. I want to do something about that at my level, at the maritime level. And so what we do is we, we try to apply, apply a risk-based model to that. In the marine environment, we're very accustomed to working. Uh, we're trying to balance security versus facilitation of commerce. There's a million regulations out there that could absolutely stop commerce, and we don't want to do that. Maritime commerce is the lifeblood of our nation. Um, Dr. Flynn will uh, talk later on today. He made a very compelling case how ports, uh, the ports were critical. And the port security isn't just the port itself, it's the whole system and, and uh, logistics chain of port security that's very critical. If, if we can't ensure the veracity of a particular type of container might come in with a uh, weapon of mass destruction, how do you know that if, if we couldn't stop that in LA Long Beach, we can't stop that in Miami? So we need to ensure port security as a, as a whole is secure. Um, in 2002, Congress passed the Maritime Transportation Security Act. One of the things that it did was it established something called the Federal Maritime Security Coordinator. It is the Coast Guard captain of the port for a particular region. And we have one single point of contact for federal maritime security uh, there, unified command. The Area Maritime Security Committee is required to bring together the federal, state, local emergency responders, industry, academia, marine fire and salvage personnel. Uh, we help assess security across the whole port. Um, we plan for various security contingencies. We have written plans and exercises and training protocols. And they are also responsible for the port security grant process. Um, we go to the source. We find out what is needed. And then through a, uh, a team-based approach, we decide on how to allocate those resources. In the last two years, I believe, the Philadelphia region has allocated about $42 million. Uh, my boss likes to say, We've done a lot of the gates, guards, guns, and uh, gadgets. Now we need to start looking across facilities and across agencies and, and, and look at the uh, security protocols for how someone from Camden could come across and help out in Marcus Hook. And uh, that's harder than you think, unfortunately, because of uh, insurance requirements and whatnot, um, mutual aid agreements and whatnot. What's, what's most important about the Area Maritime Security Committee is that it allows us six times a year, plus our um, subcommittee meetings, to gather everyone together in a room and learn about each other's, uh, what they have out there, what their concerns are, how we are going to address critical infrastructure uh, security. Back in 2001, we brought together everyone in Philadelphia region, and they sat in a room for three days and decided, okay, there's about 89 critical infrastructure pieces in this area based on death and destruction, economic consequences, um, national uh, significance for uh, symbolic reasons. 
And then we tried to apply a risk-based uh, decision-making to those 89 scenarios. Uh, a truck bomb, a vessel born IED, like the coal bomb, uh, hijackings. And then based on that, we, we come up with a risk um, score. That risk score is rank ordered. And then me, as the operator, I can decide where I need to spend my time. My assets are limited just like everyone else's. I work with my, uh, my state and local law enforcement agencies quite significantly, and they're struggling in today's economic environment with their budgets. But um, I need to know whether I should, if I go to MARSEC 2, Maritime Security Condition 2 tomorrow for an unspecified terrorism threat, where do I go with my limited assets? Do I go to the refinery that's in Philadelphia? Good choice, right? Do I go to the refinery or, or the nuclear power plant in Salem, New Jersey? Where, how do we figure that out? And using our uh, what's called maritime security risk analysis model, which looks at scenarios, threats, vulnerabilities, and consequences, I can, uh, I can choose how best to employ my limited assets. So, uh, I won't go too deeply into the maritime security risk analysis model. I believe it's the right thing to do. We've talked about it today. We have to apply risk-based decision making. And uh, you have to do it at the individual facility, at the port authority, at the state, and at the federal level. And that, I think, is how we will best protect our infrastructure. Thank you all. Um, I have a couple of questions now, and then we'll uh, get to audience questions. Um, the economy has, has been brought up, and the panelists uh, stated the economy as well as how difficult it's just has been in general to find funds to, to deal with protecting critical infrastructure. So um, starting with you, Dick, I'd love your thoughts on where we are given uh, in general just how you get the funding you need to do things, and, and also given the state of the economy, what have you noticed uh, as far as things going forward? Luckily, the federal government works on five to eight year budgets, so we haven't seen the ripple effect from the federal, and uh, I'm hopeful that we don't. Uh, we have not seen, as far as the grant programs, uh, any effect uh, on uh, assistance to the states. If anything, I'm hopeful that uh, that assistance probably increases now instead of decreases. Um, in either case, uh, we've made a, a, a very uh, successful uh, case to the federal government based on the risk-based uh, management and our regionalization program that this region should receive the lion's share and should be the last region uh, to be considered for cuts. Uh, but that's because of our close alliance with uh, New York City. Uh, the history of this region and uh, the different criteria that they set, not the least of which is uh, population density. We are, of course, the most populous uh, or the most densely populated state in the, in the Union. Uh, we have, if it's, we're going to have another event. It's, it probably won't be in Disneyland or uh, Disney World. It, it, it'll probably be in this region. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and again, applying a risk-based model, not only uh, uh, strategic uh, threat uh, analysis, but uh, the fact that this is where the media is, and, and, and the bad guys like to uh, repeat themselves. So we're cognizant, uh, and I think DHS is aware that this, this cannot be ignored. So for all of those reasons, I'm uh, not anticipating, certainly in 10, FY10, the numbers that we have seen have been very similar to the numbers of 09, and we were already talking about 11 and increases uh, depending on some of our uh, uh, alliances with uh, port and transit security grants. Uh, I mean, just last year alone, we were able to uh, convince the federal government for $151 million in transit security grants. We've done very well in the port security grants as well. Um, and so I'm optimistic that we won't see anything from the federal government. On the state government, um, you know, as you all know, we're, we're battling here with uh, uh, state budget uh, time. Um, it will not affect uh, my office significantly uh, uh, 
for a, a variety of reasons. We're not that large of an office uh, to begin with. And we uh, tend mainly to handle the federal dollars. The state dollars are considerably less, although we will be cut on, on some of those projects as well. Uh, the other reason why it won't affect us is because we deal with multi-year money instead of one-year money. The federal government's called the colors of money. Uh, but uh, ours is multi-year, which means we can carry forward. Uh, so we're dealing in multi-year projects and investments. So we probably will uh, not be as effective. And that's the way it should be. John, do you have any thoughts from your purchase? Uh, I, I think that the, the economic situation has had a, sort of a chilling effect with private sector security. Um, you know, a big part of critical infrastructure protection is what the private sector brings to the table, and they, they're not eligible directly for um, federal funding uh, for their security programs. Um, and I sit in two forums that uh, I'm starting to get that feedback from. One was the Chief Security Officer Roundtable. We had a chat about the uh, impacts of the financial crisis on their security programs. Um, and they're having to make some difficult choices about being able to engage more aggressively in things like critical infrastructure protection while they're struggling with uh, business survival. Um, so their, their ability to make the case to the C-suite about investments in security is important. The other is in the uh, state and local government coordinating council I sit on. It's one of the DHS cross-sector uh, cross-cutting councils. The companion to that is the, in, in the partnership for critical infrastructure protection, there's a private sector council as well. And uh, those are folks who uh, are every day thinking about how to integrate their security efforts with the national level critical infrastructure efforts. So I think it, it hasn't been as immediate, but I think that as they look downrange and they see additional constraints on things like uh, capital expenditures for security programs versus some more meat and potatoes uh, business interests, uh, it, it's going to be challenging. And I think uh, Dick's right, we have to see where this is going to go. And hopefully we'll be able to ride it out without too much impact. Uh, I know in my own agency, um, it's really putting a lot of emphasis on our risk assessments because we're having to make some very difficult choices internally because we are driven by uh, user fees and, and uh, um, different revenue we get from our private sector uh, tenants. And, uh, and, and that's challenging as well. As our revenue goes down, uh, it has an effect on our ability to invest in capital. Uh, so I think uh, the Port Authority is seeing some challenges now. My staff are wrestling with those uh, as long as, uh, in addition to the chief operating officer. There is one other thing I, I forgot to mention, and that is the stimulus package and its effect uh, uh, on the, the funding, especially this year. Now, that is one year money. But uh, the stimulus package, it, it affects Homeland Security in this regard, that even though we're not earmarked, or Homeland Security is not earmarked per se uh, for many of the projects, uh, certainly things like burn grants, which uh, that was, I think, a $2 billion item on the stimulus package, that had been zeroed out last year. So all of a sudden you have this windfall where we had told our uh, law enforcement people not to count on burn grants anymore. And so a lot of them were looking towards Homeland Security dollars. And because there is overlap, as you can imagine, uh, guns, uh, uh, drugs, and violence is probably uh, the most terrifying local issue involved, uh, that law enforcement's involved in. We've used uh, 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 missions like uh, information sharing dollars to overlap into uh, the, the law enforcement mission. Well, now with this stimulus, we should be able to offset some of those dollars. Uh, it, it is, uh, certainly on the burn grants, we should. Uh, so there, there, there will be some effect of that, certainly in the short run where we should have uh, a more robust security package this year. Uh, our uh, burn grant uh, alone this year for New Jersey, I think it's in the 47 mil range or something. And as I say, that's a windfall. That w we were not expecting that this year. So there will be, at least for one year, we should be in fairly decent shape on some of these offsets. Eric, if I could just tag on to what uh, Dick just said relative to the stimulus. One of the one of the hopes in the stimulus package is that relative to critical infrastructure, it would be an opportunity to apply a risk management approach to capital investments where we could build in security to uh, critical national uh, systems and, and infrastructure. Um, there's a forum at the Naval Postgraduate School uh, recently to focus on that. I'm not sure that's getting as much discussion at the national level as it probably could, because if we could use that money 
that's going to go to critical infrastructure, transit, uh, and other forms of critical infrastructure, and build security in from the start, that, that would be a major coup. Do you have any thoughts, Matt? Well, um, the current economy, and what I see at our level, is affecting largely, uh, say, the local police departments. Uh, we, we deal with the New Jersey uh, State Police Marine Unit quite frequently, and uh, Philly Police, and Port Authority Police, and Wilmington, Delaware Police. And they're, they're cutting back on overtime, and they're, they're making it um, less available. We try to do uh, two boat escorts of our propane ships going up and down the Delaware River. That second ship usually would come from a what we call an other government agency, uh, New Jersey State Police or Philly Police, whatnot. Um, we're, we're having a hard time getting them to have enough uh, overtime funding and uh, Opportunity to get out there, so it, it's becoming uh, it's becoming a challenge. Uh, I won't lie to you. And what that does is it slows down commerce. Uh, perhaps they want to move a uh, what's called a uh, critically uh, certainly dangerous cargo through the port. Well, we'd like to protect that, and they may not be able to do it on their schedule because of what we have for people available. Um, one of the questions I have for the group is. Um, as, as been well documented, uh, the majority of the critical infrastructure in the United States is private sector based, and um, sometimes it's difficult. I know some of this will probably get addressed in the next panel on cooperation issues, but I wanted to have this panel's thoughts on how you get the private sector culture to uh, harmonize with the uh, public sector <laughs> culture as far as wanting to be prepared and secure and securing critical infrastructure. So I thought that was a Well, uh we're extremely fortunate in New Jersey uh, in that regard. I mean, I get calls all the time, how have uh, I managed to convince the private sector to invest over $15 million in their own uh, critical infrastructure protection, and I wish I could take credit for that. Uh, they just decided it was good business uh, it, it, to, to protect their, their people, their their. Their infrastructure is, uh, they made a business case on their own with very little prodding before I arrived. So we have a very uh, active uh, group of uh, uh, industrialists here who, who have placed this on a high priority. Granted, that's because we're so close to 9-11 uh, uh, to and, and uh, that feeling is, is still uh, a tattoo that we'll, we'll take to our grave. So uh, I know that uh, it is not difficult to form these bonds between the critical infrastructure and key resources of the state and the, uh, and the public sector. Organizationally, because of the critical infrastructure protection program, which is, was, was uh, uh, created in 2004, there has been a requirement for the state to uh, assess the critical infrastructure and key resources of the state and submit those assessments of vulnerabilities and gaps to the federal government. And while corrections of those gaps are not binding uh, on the private uh, sector, uh, you know, they do work with us on these things and they're, as I say, they're very cognizant of them and, and most of them have taken uh, action on their own. Um, so far, we have assessed over 388 facilities uh, that we've done vulnerability assessments on within New Jersey. And we have those, and of course, uh, we, we protect that, that data. But uh, we have that information. We share that with the federal government. And I can tell you that uh, they're extremely uh, cooperative so far. And uh, you know, the government, governor, when he came in, uh, wanted to mandate some and maybe even legislate some uh, requirements on these assessments, but that has not been necessary. Uh, we have almost 99 percent compliance on our requests that, as I say, are not binding on them, but they're very forthcoming. Yeah, I think my experience is very similar to Dick's. Uh, in fact, surprisingly so, because before I got involved in uh, the State and Local Government Coordinating Council with the Infrastructure Protection Directorate and uh, attended some meetings with the uh, private sector uh, cross-sector council, they call it, which ties together all of the nation's critical infrastructure partners. Uh, and this is a group of uh, chief security officers, chief operating officers, who have responsibility for security in those major industries and are, in fact, thought leaders in the private sector. 
Um, they are very much committed because they see it uh, not only as a critical duty, but also as a part of doing business. It's good business governance. And uh, they, in many ways, already think in the risk management framework, uh, albeit that there's the profit motive that they have to balance, just like we have to balance security and mobility. They have to balance profit with security investment um, and, and a cost center. But uh, they, they are there, and in fact, they can make decisions faster than we can in the private sector um, and, and help to push us at the national level. So I'm heartened by that. We have to, though, capitalize on that energy and work with the private sector to a greater degree and facilitate uh, those efforts, so much in the way that I think has been done in the state of New Jersey and, and elsewhere. Uh, but it's uh, surprising they're, they're very committed uh, to this effort. We have to find a way to better mobilize that. Eric, I can talk to the, uh, the marine industry a little bit. It is good business to be secure. Uh, much of the oil that we get into uh, the Delaware Bay comes from places that um, maybe don't have the greatest security or uh, a lot of Western Africa uh, oil. And uh, it's in their interest to protect those super tankers, to ensure that they vet the crews, to ensure that industry ensures um, that they're not going to spill, they're not going to be um, carrying absconders or stowaways. Uh, we find that probably like all things in the marine industry, the higher the quality or higher the price of the commodity they're carrying, the better security they have. Uh, as you get further down the stream, um, you have less security. When I was uh, one mission I didn't mention is the uh, the whole stopping illegal drugs coming into the country. Remember the drug war? Did a lot of that when I was in Key West. Um, it was it was pretty clear where your highest risk was was on a uh, coastal freighter maybe coming out of the South Claw Haiti, and that was where we were going to spend a lot of our risk from the drug war, from stowaways, from illegal immigrants, and so. I think it, it's a natural part of being a successful enterprise in the, in the marine industry. Those that have higher priced commodities or want to protect those, and they're, they're doing a good job at that. All right, well, I want to thank everybody. We're going to go to questions from the audience. This is, uh, Dr. Lacey from uh, UMDMJ. Thank you. Um, whether we talk about critical infrastructure or uh, threats in general, it appears that most of the problems that occur occur because of uh, uh, mishaps in command and control or communications. So since I have Homeland Security and the ports and the Coast Guard together, let's just pose this quick question. There's an incident of uh, national significance that occurs in the port area. Who's in charge? Is it the governor? Is it New Jersey State Police? Is it NYPD? Is it PAPD? Is it uh, the principal federal official or the new designation? The name changes every few months. Who's in, pardon me, who's in charge um, and who's in charge for each stage of that? Anybody want to jump in? Um, I defer to the uniforms on command questions. So I'll let him start. <laughs> Colonel? Colonel? No? Uh, sure. I, I think we, we tried to address that with the Maritime Transportation Security Act at the port level. The Federal Maritime Security Coordinator has 51 percent of the vote, the vote, but he will not do that without a unified command. So uh, when you say incident of national significance, uh, Exxon Valdez was considered that and we came up with the uh, national contingency plan based on that. And, and on Say again? I think you would find that the, the federal government would have a, a joint FBI and Coast Guard in the maritime community, and then we would absolutely bring in Port Authority and the states. So it wouldn't be just, I'm making decisions by myself, and you know, we, we practice this. We actually have uh, exercises where I'm, I'm working alongside three states down there in, in uh, the Philadelphia region, along with, alongside the FBI, uh, typically. I believe that the, uh, it goes back to what uh, Governor Kane said at the beginning. 
uh, we're only as good as our planning, our training, and our exercising. Uh, the protocols are in place. People uh, uh, who are in charge, emergency response community, they know the protocols of what they're supposed to do. But without the training and the exercising of those things, other people that are interdependent uh, for response also need to know. So uh, the answer, the, the good news is there are protocols in place for uh, who is in charge. Uh, but as we recently found out on a nuke exercise that we had uh, up north, uh, and we pretended a nuke event had occurred, and we I think there were about 18 federal agencies that attended the, the event. I think you were there, the doctor, right? And uh, the question was posed, you know, who is in charge? A nuclear event just occurred in uh, northern Jersey or, or right over the statue. Uh, and we got a variety of answers. And it, it wasn't that there wasn't an answer. It was that a lot of people who were around that table did not know. Many thought, well, the federal government's here to support the governor, and so the governor is in charge because all emergencies are local, and they all begin that way, and so you need that central command. Uh, we very quickly determined that if it indeed was a nuke, uh, the governor is totally overwhelmed uh, immediately, uh, but for about 24 hours, it, it, we're going to have to see to ourselves uh, until the response came in from the federal government, and then all of these 18 agencies kind of kicked in. It goes back to what the governor said. We, we, we have the protocols, they're written down, we, but does everyone know them? I think that's the challenge, in my opinion, is that we need to train, we need to exercise more, uh, either through tabletops or actual practical exercise. And, and that is something that we do need to do more of. I think I'm worried. Be, be scared. Be very scared. Yes, I, I'd like to uh, to follow up on something Dr. Lacey gave as an example: the uh, nuke on a ship in in the harbor. Uh, how important a metric is it in your profession uh, for the number of ships that are coming in that are actually searched? How has that metric been changing over the past eight years? Do you have enough resources to do that, or is that really not as urgent as it seems to me to be? Who wants to grab it? I'll, uh, I'll grab that lightning rod. <laughs> Why not? Um, I, as, a, as a port authority, um, we facilitate the movement of cargo. We're really a landlord port, but we have a tremendous stake, obviously, in what happens in terms of supply chain security. And I have to say, I, I really have to challenge the efficacy of 100% uh, physical screening on the basis of the amount of resources and time it takes to do that. If our focus is maritime security, you have to think whether or not a terrorist is actually going to relinquish hands-on control of a nuclear device and put it into the supply chain where it might, in fact, be intercepted if we're lucky, or just simply move it across the Mexican border in a truck. Um, and, and so we have to balance where we apply our resources. And I, having observed them struggle with this challenge, when I look at what uh, Customs and Border Protection is trying to do in partnership with the Coast Guard and state and local government, they're attempting to manage the risk, giving the level of resources that's applied, and the full 360-degree approach that they need to have to security, because it's not just the supply chain. So everyone looks at the as, the as the container as the Trojan horse. And in fact, we had an exercise just pre-9-11 that was basically called that. Um, but I'm concerned about that. But I'm also concerned about the small boat that gets off a tanker that doesn't go into the supply chain, that moves into a Bayonne and uh, offloads it into a van. I mean, there are many different ways that that device could get to its target. And I think we ought to think about this holistically rationally and look at a risk-based approach to try and tease out the threat as best we can. I think that Customs and Border Protection and the State Department are working aggressively with our trading partners to implement uh, security standards and, we, uh, and, and for the inspection of cargo. And we ought to continue to press that envelope. But I'm very leery about a simple blanket statement that we need 100 percent cargo screening of every single container because I'm not sure at the end of the day that's practical. And if we did do it, would we be drawing resources away from some other hole in the Swiss cheese that we haven't covered down on? Question here? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. I, I completely concur. 
Um, following up on that, we, you know, New Jersey is target rich. We've got tunnels, we've got the Port Authority, we've got the train stations, we've got uh, the, the Northeast Corridor rail line. Uh, you talked about containers and the, and the, and the, um, and the waterways. Um, are we using active surveillance? Um, and is this something that, that, when I say active, that we're constantly monitoring? Or is it surveillance that we have, like with security cameras, that we check after the fact? How has our surveillance increased since 9-11? Uh, I'm, I'm going to let uh, John answer most of that, because I'm a believer that if we have another incident in this area, it's probably going to be on Port Authority property. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> Hopefully not before I retire. <laughs> but uh, as far as all of the, the rest of New Jersey, not Port Authority property, but the rest of New Jersey, uh, I, uh, I can tell you that as I mentioned before, we're in a deterrence mode when you talk about prevention in these open environments. There is no other strategy that's practical. You can't search the luggage in uh, our mass transit system or every passenger that goes in. So we're, we're very, very vulnerable to an IED on a train uh, or any type of conveyance for that matter, or stadiums or any place that, that is open. Um, so the only deterrence that we have is vigilance, is, uh, I don't want to use the word profile, but certainly the, the sixth sense of, uh, uh, which incidentally is, is a true science. Uh, it's uh, uh, nothing more than uh, experience and probability combined, you know, but that's uh, on, on experts who are doing behavioral uh, patterns and studies. So we do have undercovers on trains. We have people looking at those uh, patterns proactively uh, as part of our overall strategy. Uh, uh, but as I say, uh, you know, it, it, a missile can get through that radar. You know, there's no question about that. That's our, our most vulnerable place. But we do have proactive measures. And uh, John, you can talk about the port. Yeah, I think uh, just as, uh, as Dick works with his counterparts in the state of New York and, and New York City uh, to build regional coordination for security and preparedness, we mirror that at the next level down, working with our transportation partners. We started very early after 9-11, in fact, immediately after 9-11, with New Jersey Transit and the MTA on a collaborative exchange of security practices. And that was mostly at the engineering or technical level for some time. And increasingly, uh, we built operational partnerships, even though our systems are, are somewhat, well, in many ways, very interdependent with one another. There's a lot of those systems, like in the MTA, that has little to do with, the, say, PATH, for example. But PATH is tremendously interconnected with New Jersey Transit. And uh, even before the, the Transit Security Grant Program came to the fore and required this in major regions, we were already collaborating uh, in an informal way on in technical exchange and operational protocols, because we all face the same challenge. So uh, what we've done most recently using grant funding has been to uh, actually move out in some deliberate ways on pre-attack surveillance methodologies, identifying uh, behavior through behavior pattern recognition techniques, potential uh, acts of pre-attack surveillance. Uh, when you get attacked, that's not the first time the terrorist comes to visit your target. There's a whole cycle, and it's what's called the attack cycle, where they begin to do some remote planning that says, hey, I want to go and do something that's bad. They do some reconnaissance on the internet, and we've been hit because a lot of our information is, in fact, already out there in the public domain. And then they come to pay you a visit. They walk through your facility. They take photos. Um, and uh, we saw that in Cobar Towers. Uh, after the fact, the postmortem on Cobar identified um, multiple uh, pre-attack, uh, basically indicators of pre-attack surveillance at that location. Um, we've heard about the attack, uh, or the planned attack, anyway, in the, in the can of uh, financial institutions in this region, uh, Prudential Building in particular. Well, you know, if you look at the history of that particular uh, planning evolution, um, an individual sat in the Starbucks across the street with a laptop was recording the movements in and out of that, that building. Uh, so this is not the first time they see you, so it shouldn't be the first time we see them or see things like that. Um, there have been documented cases actually on video of pre-attack surveillance of key targets in the Washington, D.C. metro area. So both the state of New Jersey, New York City, and the state of New York have a very strong suspicious activity reporting program. That information gets immediately fed to the fusion centers um, and is shared with the JTTF. Um, those leads are all investigated. Um, and that information is uh, analyzed to identify patterns of pre-attack surveillance that might uh, lead us to think that critical infrastructure might be attacked. That's the outer ring. 
So you have sort of the intelligence network and sharing between agencies, local, state, and federal. You have closer in uh, surveillance to try and identify pre-attack surveillance uh, activities, uh, suspicious activity reporting. Uh, and then the uh, physical security systems, security monitoring, access controls, and the like. Now, transit is Swiss cheese, right? Because our job is to move people. If we slowed it down, the inspector wouldn't be, able, wouldn't be able to do that. But the idea is that you have defense in depth for security. And just like a block of Swiss cheese, hopefully if you layer it enough, you'll close down on the gaps. And if you have a failure in one, you may catch it in another. Our maritime security is like that. Our airport security is like that. So if you walk around and go to a facility and say, well, that's a gap in security. My god, something's going to happen. You may not know that, in fact, security is layered and there are other checks and balances behind that. Um, so I can't say that I sleep well at night uh, relative to the threat to transit. Uh, the IED threat, the suicide bomber, is a big risk. But the suicide bomber, frankly, and I hate to be crass about this, is not going to kill as many people as they did on 9-11. And on a risk-based uh, level, we have to prepare for the 9-11 catastrophe, and there are a lot of those targets that are still relatively vulnerable we need to pay attention to. But we also then need to you know, give our operating people, our police, the ability to identify the potential suicide bomber. Um, and we're looking at standoff detection technologies that will allow us to do that better as part of our surveillance package. So integrated security, defense in depth, and interagency coordination and information sharing are key. I will say that, uh, I'm sorry, Fort, Fort Dix 6 actually targeted my facility. And we have the picture on the wall that they took driving by our facility in Philadelphia. And it is a little disconcerting, but I, I agree with the Colonel. Uh, absolutely, defense in depth, sharing of information across agencies. And, and not all parts of, I forget how many acres you have, sir, but not all parts of those facilities need to be secured so that you can also go to a core area. Um, at a uh, refinery, perhaps, we, we have security protocols in place, and you must carry what's now called a transportation worker identification credential run through the TSA. And that is a uh, controversial program, and it's just coming into place. But unless you have the card, you can't get onto the facility. And then there's a secondary layer of security for the more uh, critical operations and whatnot. So it's uh, like he says, you can't protect everything. You hope to plug up the holes in a Swiss, Swiss cheese, cheese through layers. The question about communication, which we've heard from all speakers this morning, is critical as we move forward in this dangerous environment. And looking back to 9-11, when lack of communication between New York City police and fire was identified as a major problem in terms of saving lives, focusing on the Port Authority, do you have today the ability to communicate uh, in a real-time environment emergency information uh, with New York Police, New York Fire, uh, Weehawken, and other agencies that would have uh, responder uh, responsibilities in, in the Port Authority uh, service area. We, I, I will say we have far better communications in our ability than we have had before. I think we still have some, some gaps in key locations, uh, particularly because of the kinds of facilities we operate, the tunnels and bridges. Uh, Port Authority Trans Hudson is a very challenging communications environment. Um, and we've gone through one exercise in New Jersey where we were actually able to uh, sort of operationalize those challenges in a way. During that exercise, we literally on, on one platform level path had five tripod antennas from the different agencies that were all trying to communicate through electronic means in a tunnel environment. And basically squelching out each other. So we're working through those kinds of issues. I'd like to make two points about interoperability. One, I think that the interoperability issue on land mobile radio has in many ways been tremendously mischaracterized. That's a, it's a personal view. It doesn't reflect the views of the management. The personal view is that there's a lot we can do in interoperability with existing spectrum that uh, requires operational protocols between the agencies. And breaking through those rice bowls and those agency traditions are sometimes difficult. Particularly if we have known targets, there's no reason why we shouldn't, in our playbook, have an incident command structure that has a communications plan that divides up the available spectrum and provides a cache of radios for people to be able to communicate. Um, we don't need a radio that talks to everyone all the time. 
because the idea isn't that police police officer needs to talk to a fire officer. It's a commander needs to talk to a commander to make decisions. The second point is that there's a problem beyond interoperability of land mobile radios, and that problem is communication between command nodes to share real-time situational awareness, to get visualization of what's actually happening on the ground, to make real-time decisions and collaborate real-time in a dispersed environment. That's op center to op center or incident command post to incident command post communications that involves more than just voice, land mobile radio. We spend a lot of time on operation centers, command post vehicles, and the like. Um, but we all buy stuff from different vendors. A lot of it's proprietary, and it doesn't integrate. So our commanders at different echelons can't integrate the picture they get from different agencies with different traditions, operational protocols, and different ways of doing business. There's no reason why in this country we shouldn't be able to standardize some of those operational protocols between operation centers that gives us that kind of connectivity. So I've seen it from Hurricane Katrina, World Trade Center. I've been involved in every top-off exercise since before 9-11. In the top two or three uh, critical issues in those after-action reports are all command control and communications. And I don't think that we've adequately addressed those protocols yet. It gets to Dr. Lacey's question before. <clears throat> Murray Turoff, NGIT. If you take any of the critical infrastructures, sewers, electrical power lines, uh, roads, <coughs> pipelines, and you plot their average age, for the past 30 years, every year, they've been getting older. And today, over those 30 years, you look at any of them, they're 10 to 15 years older than they were 30 years ago. Uh, what this leads to is some really <coughs> serious problems. Uh, if you do a risk analysis, uh, you've got to do mitigation options for making sure for hardening these facilities as well as for just maintaining them, which they aren't being done. Uh, and that means that some of these disasters uh, like the Northeast Power Blackout, the bridge that failed in the, the West recently. The Vermont power outages due to the ice storms were due to a large part lack of maintenance so forth. They're partially man-made. They're not natural. How do we get politicians to change their attitude about maintaining our critical infrastructures? Because that's the easiest thing they can cut. You know, uh, uh, that's just the first. And the other is that we can't do it just on dollars. You've got to look at detail. In Katrina, when the water came in, all the recent power pumps for the levees went out immediately. The ones that were 50 years or older kept working because they were built to work underwater. Now that detail gets lost somewhere up the chain. Well, I think that's a great segue into uh, Steve Flynn's uh, presentation of resiliency. And um, there's no question that some of the uh, critical infrastructure around the country and in this state uh, is, uh, is at risk. Uh, I, for one, you know, I've I listened to Steve's presentation many times. I read his book, and I certainly agree with him that uh, more needed to be done. Now, when he wrote that, it was before this economic crisis and before the stimulus package. I, for one, uh, applauded the fact that we might get a twofer out of this thing, that uh, by putting people at work, we're going to rebuild some of our critical infrastructure while we're doing that. I think that's terrific. Uh, sure, it's going to cost an extra trillion dollars, but it was always going to cost a trillion dollars whether it's a levee in California that's about to break or a bridge uh, in, uh, uh, in this state, of which we have, I think, over 6,000, and uh, many of them are at, at, at risk. So uh, I think in that regard, hopefully it is going to be addressed uh, through the stimulus package because at the end of the day, it always comes down to money. And that's the reason it has not been addressed over the years is because people have just uh, ignored it. You know, and, and I don't think that is uh, uh, that's good policy. John? 
Yeah, I think we're missing a tremendous opportunity. We don't. We were applying risk management on a uh, on a certain level at, at facilities um, and national level, looking at terrorism, but we're not doing it writ large relative to critical infrastructure. And we haven't broken the code on working with the private sector to recapitalize a lot of this critical infrastructure and uh, address the key single points of failure we now have in a lot of those uh, networked systems we have out there that were built for efficiency but not security or resilience. All right, well, I want to, we've reached our time limit, so I wanted to thank everybody for attending this panel and stick around. The next panel will be starting right after this. Thanks, our speakers.